I will begin by just uh, finishing up what I uh, didn't get the chance to finish last time. So let me just recall where we stopped. So, well, we had uh, G1 gamma, we called this X, and we had H modulo gamma intersect H, and this was Y, Y lived inside X, so we had a picture that looked kind of like this. Y, this is X. And so gamma inside G was a lattice. And maybe irreducible. I know what this means. If not, it's not too important. And H inside G was was called, well, it was a closed subgroup with a property. What was the property? The property was that G mod H was something that, that's called an affine symmetric variety. This was the setup, and we proved the following type of equidistribution result. So, uh, yeah, so, so let me also remark that this was done by Eskin McMullen in dynamical terms, but it was also done in some more special case, in uh, perhaps less detailed and more technical methods using spectral uh, theory by uh, Duke, R Rudnick, and Sarnak. This was, I was told to, it's good to mention this, so. At this point, so these, these methods and the techniques that uh, I'll describe, so they can, be, 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 they can be made effective. So these guys were the first to get an error term, but the dynamical methods that these guys introduced somehow uh, turn out to be, are more popular and have been extended uh, more. Okay, so the equidistribution result was the following, that for any beta, let's say, absolutely, well, continuous of compact support, on X, the average over an orbit of Y, so Y times G, right? So Y lives inside X, and we push it around using an element in G. So we integrate beta, then this approaches the average of beta over X. As G goes to infinity in this variety G mod H. This was the equidistribution result, and how did we show it? Well, uh, if, so what we did is we thickened Y a little bit. We made it a little bit bigger than, so, and instead of taking a manifold Y, we took an open set, and we showed that the open set, we had this equidistribution result for the open set, and we also showed that because of the assumptions, because of this assumption that G mod H is a fine symmetric variety, this open set really was nearby the variety itself, the orbit of the variety. So it didn't change too much. I should made one, make one remark, which is that uh, the paper, the original paper, really the argument they give applies only when Y is compact. If Y is not compact, then this is not, uh, then you have to be more careful and uh, this has been treated uh, later by other people. But we're essentially working under the assumption that Y is compact. And now I'm going to explain the proof of uh, counting. So from equidistribution, and the result is the following. Uh, so now we have a sequence BN of what are called well-rounded sets. Oops. So I'll remind you what the definition of well-rounded is when uh, we'll need it. And these well-rounded sets are in G mod H. And we had the orbit of gamma. So the statement was that the number of elements in this orbit was approximately the volume of Bn. Uh, uh, so we're assuming that the volume of Bn 
goes to infinity. As n goes to infinity, and so uh, so this is this is this picture now is happening in g mod h. This is g mod h, and it's some variety. And we said that typically this orbit, the orbit of a point, is going to be dense under gamma, but in some special cases, so if gamma intersects H, gamma intersects H in a lattice, then you get a discrete set, and we were counting the discrete set as it, how it uh, behaves itself as you take larger and larger, for example, open balls. So if you imagine that this is in three space, intersect this hyperboloid with a three-dimensional sphere and a three-dimensional ball, and you will get a well-rounded set, and you can get this counting. Okay, so uh, l let me say one, one thing, uh, w which is what we'll do next after I prove this counting and inequality distribution. You'll notice that I write everywhere the volume of y, the volume of x. So all of these volumes can be normalized to be one, uh, and so they can go away. But in general, they're interesting numbers, so they have interest in number theory, for example, or uh, they're just, you know, mathematics is about numbers, and these are numbers, and they're, they can be interesting numbers. And uh, after I prove this countering result, I'll come back to the question of what these volumes can be, or what these numbers can, can come up to be if you don't normalize them to be one. If you use natural uh, normalizations as, is, as opposed to just uh, making everything a probability measure. Okay, so now the proof of counting is going to be in two steps. So step one is going to be an average version averaged version. So we'll define the following function, fn of g, to be the number of the elements in this orbit intersected with not bn, but g times bn. So we move this set, this ball, we can move it around a little bit. And uh, so, this is, so this is well defined on uh, G mod gamma. So if you act by on G on the left by an element in gamma, then you're not changing this count. So this is a well-defined function. And what we'll show is that for any beta, the integral uh, over G mod gamma. So we'll, say, we'll show that as n goes to infinity, this function weakly, meaning that the integral of Fn times beta approaches well, let, let me divide then now by the volume of Bn. It approaches uh, the integral over G mod gamma of beta. So in other words, the, the, this function divided by the volume in the weak sense for any function beta, uh, it approaches, uh, yeah, so, it, so for this function in the weak sense approaches one, meaning that for any beta this holds. And then step two will be that two, will use well-roundedness of Bn to conclude what we want, that Fn of G, sorry, Fn of the identity, 1 over the volume of Bn, goes to 1. And this is what the count. So we're going to prove first an average uh, version. And the step, so Step one will be, is not going to use much about, uh, yeah, it's not going to use much about the BNs, so it's not going to use this well-roundedness property. So how, how are we going to prove this average version? So we have the following diagram. Uh, so we have our space G mod H on which our business is happening, and we have G mod gamma, and we want to connect these spaces, and the way to connect them is to take this intermediate space. So here we kind of unfold this G mod gamma. Sorry. Uh, so we have uh, this kind of unfolding. And so what is the fiber here? Uh, so what is the, f so when you project this, so there's a natural map this way. So what is the fiber? The fiber is just going to be H divided by gamma intersect H. This is uh, the volume. The fibers here have finite volume over this 
thing. They don't have finite bond here, but that's, uh, that's okay. So we have our sets BN here. Uh, so let, let, let's call, so set, uh, okay. So th then you can pull them back. So just take their pre-image and you have BN tilde. And we'll set, let's say, oops, set alpha and tilde to be uh, the indicator function of these sets B and tilde. So I should note the following. So note the volume. So I, I realize now that I think I'm off here by a constant, and I think I should, I should have here a volume of uh, y. So the volume of this symmetric space should appear here. So I apologize in advance. I'm going to have to modify this a little bit, but not too much. I, I just realized that I forgot this factor. So the volume of uh, Bn, well, the volume of Bn is the volume of Bn, but the volume of Bn tilde is the volume of Bn times the volume of the fiber, uh, which is gamma. And this is just the same thing as the volume of y. Okay, so uh, so this is what so we have this function here, which I called alpha and tilde. Oops, alpha and tilde. And now we're going to project this function. So set alpha n to be this kind of uh, push forward. So you just. push this function down just like we did in the circle problem. So uh, you sum over all the pre-images that you see here. So this function has finite, uh, this alpha and tilde, it has finite integral. So when you push it forward, it's going to be almost everywhere well-defined and it's going to have a finite integral. It's going to be a decent function. And what we're interested in, so we want, uh, yeah, so so, um, so what, what, what is it that we want? We want to, uh, investigate this uh, function. So I claim that, so this is, so this alpha n is just fn of g. So alpha n of g is just fn of g. Because w w why so? Well, w we're supposed to count how many, where is it? Where did I define fn? Yes, here it is. So we're supposed to define how many cosets do you see for a given g and so, so let's just check this, the identity. So this, uh, this counts how many pre-images do you get uh, here, that, how many points in this coset. So you have this projection. All these points will lift to copies of uh, our group. And when you project them, they will give you at the identity, if you evaluate them, they will give you exactly the number of points that you've seen in this orbit. Okay, is, is this identity clear or should I? Okay, nobody's objecting for good or for bad, so. Uh, sorry? No, so uh, now I've put alpha n is the push forward. I've push forward at this, right? Yeah, this is without tilde. Oh, sorry. This? Yeah, so Alpha n is just the push forward of this function. Okay, so so this is the uh, th this is what we have. So okay, so now so now uh, I I want to uh, claim that this yeah. So so what, what so, so how how can we think of this function f n g or alpha n uh, alpha n g? You you take this pre image. So for every uh, point in here, you have a copy of uh, y which has been translated and then you push it down. So you have, a co for every point in here, you have a copy of this H modulo gamma intersect H. So you have a copy of Y and then you push it down in here. And we know that the, each of these copies, each of these elements equidistributes, right? So, uh, so let me write this. Okay, so so we know the following. So equidistribution tells us equidistribution tells us that one over the volume of y 
integral of y g over beta converges to the integral over x, oops, one over the volume of x, integral over x in, of beta. And now, the, uh, by this, so if you disintegrate, or in other words, if you just do Fubini, uh, so we're, we're interested in this integral over gamma mod g of fn of g by beta, beta, so this is x. Okay, so this integral, if you disintegrate it, yeah, so, so I, I claim that, sorry, let, let me put this uh, normalizing factor in front. So the, this integral I claim is that it's equal to one over this volume of Bn. And then now we're going to integrate over Bn. And so if we have an element G in here, then we're going to integrate uh, over Y times G beta. This is So let me just say class of G because really, you see when you're in, so Bn is contained in G mod H. And uh, yeah, so, 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 so I, I claim that this uh, integral, so if, if you just unfold whatever integration we've been doing here, so the, from the definition of Fn, uh, you, you, sh you will get an integral like this. And, and so now we're basically done because, yeah, so, so, so the individual terms, so integral y g beta. So this thing converges to, again, I have to do the right normalization. And so because the volumes of Bn grow to infinity, you get that, so in this picture, you get that as G goes off to infinity, you, for this coset, you get this equidistribution. So you get that more and more of your set Bn, it has to, since its volume goes to infinity, most of the set has to have these elements further and further away. So you get this uh, convergence. So once you're averaging over a set for which you know this point-wise uh, convergence, then you, you can get your convergence for, for the whole integral. Okay, you're, into, you're averaging a function and you know that each individual term as g goes to infinity, as bn gets larger, for most, BN, for most elements in bn, you'll have this, that this is approximately this. So, yeah. This part you can't see? Uh, it's because of the light. So here it's the integral, so it's, it's a double integral. It's an integral over Bn, one over volume Bn. So this coset G, uh, you're integrating over this and then you translate Y, the submanifold by this element G, and then you uh, integrate beta over that translate. So. If you go back to this picture that I had over here, for each element g, you push y around, and then you integrate over y, uh, over all g's that live in bn, in that coset. And you, uh, you average it out, and you know that as bn gets larger and larger, most of the elements have to have this equidistribution. Okay. So this was step one, and now for step two, we, we can do we have to use the well-roundedness of this Bn. Step two. So again, we're going to prove that for any epsilon, so for any epsilon, this function, yes, so we want to show that for any epsilon, this function is one goes to one minus, roughly one plus or minus epsilon. And for this, we're going to take this beta to be a small function in the neighborhood of uh, the identity. So 
pick beta to be a bound function in a small neighborhood of of identity in this quotient. And so we get this uh, convergence by, from step one. But what, what was the definition of well-roundedness? So remember, well-roundedness meant the following. It said that uh, for any epsilon, there exists a small neighborhood of the identity, which is what we would pick, which is the, gives meaning to what how small we have to pick this neighborhood uh, identity. So let me call it U, such that we have the following estimates. We have uh, one minus epsilon, the volume of, now here we take the union over all G in uh, this neighborhood G n, it's less than or equal to the volume of bn. So it's saying that if you move around bn a little, uh, smear it out by this open neighborhood, you're really not increasing the volume of that set by too much. And similarly, this is less than or equal to less than or equal to one plus epsilon times the volume of, now you take the intersection of all of these things. So it's saying that if you move around the, these sets and you take the elements which are everywhere, then uh, you haven't increased the volume by too much. So this implies, so this implies that for small enough, small enough uh, neighborhoods, uh, Fn of G, let me say it like this, one over the volume of Bn times Fn of G, uh, and one over the volume of Bn Fn of the identity uh, differ by less than epsilon. Right? It's saying, so it's saying that if you want to count uh, in translates, right? so you have the set Bn and you want to count how, the, how this translate intersects. So we had the set and so this was our Bn and we wanted to count the number of points in here. So this thing, this well-roundedness says that if you move it, this set around a little bit, you're not and you normalize by the volume, you're not changing uh, the set itself so much. So the count uh, for, this, for, for these things, they don't differ too much if you move the set a little bit. Right, because this Fn of G counts the intersection, uh, the, uh, counts the number of points in G, uh, G applied to Bn, and if you move uh, Bn a little bit, it's the set, uh, you, you, you'll, you'll get that the volume is roughly the same and then you apply the counting to that. Okay, so, so, so you get that the, this function near the identity, so a different way to say it is that this counting function near, near the identity is almost continuous, is basically a continuous function. Uh, e fn of g is continuous near the identity. And now uh, we have this average result you see, we have that for any beta, we have this convergence. So in particular, uh, it, if beta is this bump function, this shows that uh, Fn of the identity divided by this volume goes to one. So, from, so I don't want to erase this. So from step one, uh, so the, uh, which is the average version, Uh, plus this uh, continuity at identity of the, these functions. So I, I mean continuity in the 
this kind of generalized sense. I mean, it's not that each function is continuous, but rather they have this, this limit has this property. Uh, you get that uh, fn of the identity, so one over the volume of bn fn of the identity uh, goes to one. Okay, so th this fin finishes the the proof of counting. Other questions about this or no? Okay, so uh, in the remaining time, let me try to, as I said, I, my, my goal was to have different uh, topics for each lecture, and I was hoping I could finish this uh, last time, but it didn't happen. So uh, I, I, in this lecture, I want to talk about so you can forget everything that I talked about, but I want to talk about these notions of volumes. So volumes of these uh, uh, manifolds uh, of these symmetric spaces. So I, wanna, I want to tell you about something called Ziegel's formula. So it says the following. So it says that the volume of, let me see if I want to quotient on the left or on the right for this lecture. It's always confusing. Uh, yeah, on the right. So. The volume of SLNR mod SLNZ is equal to the following product, zeta of 2, dot, 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 zeta of n, where zeta is the zeta function, the UN zeta function, and it's the sum 1 over n to the s, n from 1 to infinity. So it has this uh, nice formula. Uh, and you see, so there's a separate theorem that this space, so the, the group SLNR has what's called the higher measure, but it's unique, it's only well defined up to scaling. So of course you can always choose this measure so that this volume is one. But the claim is that there's a natural measure and there's an interesting meaning in which this uh, space has finite volume and the volume is a number which uh, is of some interest. Uh, So I want to compare this with the to show you what kind of uh, integral this refers to. So if you look at SL to Z, everybody knows this, uh, or hopefully you've seen this fundamental domain. We have this little tooth that is the fundamental domain for SL to R act, SL to Z acting on this space. And the integral, so let me call this domain D. So the volume of D is, if you do the integral with the metric that has curvature, curvature uh, minus one, I guess you get pi over three. And as you know, uh, what's zeta of two? Do you guys know this? was the sum of the inverse of the squares. This is, people are whispering, but can somebody say it louder? Pi squared over six, very good. So it's off by a factor of pi and the rational number. So the rational number is because of normalizations, but the factor of pi comes from the fact that the upper half plane is SL to R mod uh, SO to R. And this is the unit circle, and the unit circle itself has a factor of 2 pi. So if you compute the volume of SL to R, you'd get here, for example, something like 2 pi squared over 3. But the, one of the issues is this kind of normalization uh, of uh, volume, which uh, I, I didn't talk about. So uh, I'm not going to go too much into the normalization of volume. And instead of, uh, so I would say that rather than, so th the reason why I chose to tell you about this formula is because it's a nice excuse to talk about a very useful tool, which is uh, useful for other things, things other than computing these kinds of volumes. And this tool is what's called Ziegel transforms. So, uh, yeah, so, so the, the setup is this. You have a function from R 
let's say, from Rd to sorry, uh, Rn to the complex numbers, sorry, uh, I don't like n to be the dimension, so l l l let me, from now on, call d the dimension of the ambient space. And so if delta, so recall that the space SL and R mod SL dr over SL dz is the moduli space moduli space of lattices. There's delta inside Rd. So an element here can be identified with uh, a lattice. So a lattice is just a, a picture like this. So giving a lattice is the same as giving a basis for this lattice. And if you, uh, you can choose many different bases for this lattice. So you can choose, for example, these two vectors. Or maybe you can choose one of these or anything you like, any two vectors will give you uh, a lattice as long as they're linear independent. And this corresponds to SLDR. The fact that you can change basis using a matrix of SL in SLDZ uh, implies that if you quotient by this ambiguity, then you just get the space of lattices. So anytime you have a point in there, you have a lattice. Okay, so the Ziegel transform is the following kind of thing. It's gonna take a function on RD and produce a function on the space of lattices. And So it's, let, me, let me write it here so that I don't have to erase it. So the function f, the Ziegel transform of f at the lattice d is just defined to be the sum over v in delta of f of v. So if you have a function, say, in R2, in that picture, you sum it over all the lattice points. And this is clearly independent of a basis of a lattice. So it's just a function. So this is a function. From, so I'm going to, okay, so. And I assume that f is reasonably nice as a function. So uh, w one thing which is a little bit unfortunate and if you look at various places that deal with these equal transforms is that there are a hundred different uh, versions of it. So I'm going to denote also the, what's called the reduced, uh, th this is not standard terminology. So people will call any of the things that I'll define as Eagle transform, so, but I want to distinguish them for this lecture. So let's call the reduced Eagle transform the function where you sum over all vectors except the zero vector. So the zero vector is always in the lattice, so you might want to throw that away. And there's another one, which is the primitive Eagle transform, where you sum over Again, all vectors, which are what's called primitive. So what, what, what's a primitive vector? So V inside delta is primitive. Primitive if uh, one over L D is not in the lattice for any L uh, in uh, Z, or let's say, for any natural number uh, that's bigger than one. So if you cannot rescale your vector, so the, the, what, 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 what vectors are good and what vectors are bad? So these three vectors are primitive, but this vector 2, 2 is not primitive because it's a multiple of 1, 1. So 1, 1 is good, this is okay, this is bad. Uh, so 1, 1 is good, 2, 2 is bad. And so if you write them uh, with integer coefficients, it just means that uh, the entries have GCD equal to 1. So if they have no common divisor, then uh, this is what it means for a vector B primitive. So each of these transforms has nice, uh, has, pro has good properties. So uh, this one is the most symmetric, and I'll explain why, in, in what sense is the most symmetric. Uh, the reduced one uh, has uh, very nice properties, and this one is actually what you can compute with. Uh, okay, so, uh, yeah? Sorry, can you say a little bit? 
Oh, yeah, 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 yes, yes, thank you so much. Uh, so, so Vladis is such that, our, uh, let me say this, so all lattices are, so the volume of this is equal to one. So this is called a unimodular lattice, and indeed everything I'm talking about is for unimodular, thank you, for unimodular lattices, so co-volume one. This is equivalent, so this corresponds to the condition that the uh, determinant of matrices is one. Okay, so this is the Ziegel transforms. So, uh, so what, what, what are, l l let me state the, their basic properties. So the properties are the following. So the, the main, uh, one very nice uh, property is that this is SLDR equivariant. What, what does this mean? You see you have, uh, so the Ziegel transform, it goes from functions on RD to functions on, on uh, G, uh, SLD. So I, I'm going to start abbreviating as G mod gamma because SLDR so, and SLDZ are too much to write. Uh, so wh wh why is this, uh, wh in what sense is it uh, equivariant? It's equivariant in the sense that if you act by a function on RD, so a matrix acts on RD so it can act on functions, and if you do the Ziegel transform, it's the same as just acting on the Ziegel transform function on the other side. And you can see this geometrically because uh, here you're summing over the lattice. So if you, what does it mean to act on the function by, the, uh, by a matrix? It means that you, you can change the function, but this is the same as changing the lattice. So you can just work out this expression by moving the element g from the lattice to uh, the, from the function to the lattice. Okay, this is the main, uh, uh, this is the main property. So, uh, yes, so, so th 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 there's the following uh, kind of very useful uh, property and it's called Poisson summation. So this is why uh, this full Ziegel transform is good. So remember, uh, uh, Poisson summation formula tells you the following, that uh, if you have a function, so the sum over f of v, where v is in uh, some lattice delta, is the sum, so the sum of the values of a function over a lattice, it's the sum over the values in the dual lattice, where uh, now you take the Fourier transform of f. So this is how uh, the function interacts with uh, Fourier transform. So th this is just a, a formula in Fourier analysis. So if you take, so if d is z to the d, then d dual is just is also z to the d. But in general, if d is some matrix g in SLDR. So if you represent it by a matrix, you take the columns and you, this is a basis. How do you get the dual matrix? The dual, a dual lattice is just uh, inverse transpose. All right? So it has, this, uh, it has this duality. So in particular, it tells you the following thing, that uh, if you, where is it? So if you take a function and you take its Ziegel transform, uh, you get some new function on the new space, but if you take the, Fourier, the Ziegel transform of the Fourier, so if you take the Ziegel transform of a function and you want to compare it to the Ziegel transform of the Fourier transform, then this is uh, kind of the dual where you have this dualization which exchanges. Uh, so you have this involution on the space of lattices which takes a lattice to its dual. So Fourier transform kind of exchanges this, uh, this property, th this uh, Ziegel transform. Okay. So uh, the remark I wanted to make was that this uh, Poisson summation is only true for the full Ziegel transform, 
but the equivalence is true for any of these uh, two, because uh, for any of these three, because yeah, because the notion of primitive doesn't have to do anything with S L two R. So uh, okay, so why why are uh, yeah, so, so let, let, let me make the following boundedness, uh, so remark on boundedness, why some people prefer the reduced. Uh, so the reduced Eagle transform, it really goes from L1 of Rd to L1 of G1 gamma. So in other words, the, uh, if you take, you, you can define it for Lebesgue integrable functions. So here, I was assuming that F is maybe smooth and complexly supported, and you get something nice, but in fact, the reduced, if you're not summing the value at zero, then on average, this, uh, so then this is a well-defined function which uh, actually preserves essential integrals. And, sorry, question, yeah? So dual just means uh, there's an evolution on the space of lattices, and you just, Take the function, you apply the you evaluate the function at the at the dual point. So G dual at the lattice delta is G at the dual lattice. Is this okay? All right. So let let, let me uh, kind of try to get to the pun uh, to the punchline at least uh, to end the lecture on something with content. So. What's important is the following fact. So you see, if you have uh, a f an operation which allows you to produce move from functions to uh, on one space to functions on another, then the dual, the the trans, you know, there's always the dual thing which allows you to move measures, right? So if you have a measure on G mod gamma, then you can. Uh, oh. If you have, a, you can transport using. So the, I'm gonna again, okay, so let me call it the transpose operator. So it goes from measures on, on uh, G mod gamma to measures on maybe probability measures, or just finite measures, measures on RD. Yeah, so, uh, so this is what, uh, what, 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 so, so how does it do? So if you have mu as a measure on G mod gamma, then you define the transpose. So how do you define a measure on Rd? Well, a measure is something, if you give it a function, it gives you a number. So if you want to apply it to a function on Rd, you just apply mu, the measure on G mod gamma, to the Ziegel transform of the function. Okay. And again, this is equivariant, so this, this function, so this, everything here is uh, SLDR equivariant. Meaning that if you have a measure here and you move it to RD, then you could also apply an, an element in SLDR to the left, move the measure, and then it's the same as moving the resulting measure on the other side. So now, oh, let me keep the, Z equals formula here. So now the key point is that this is going to be a claim. So we have uh, a, a favorite measure on G mod gamma, which is SLDR invariant. So which measure is SLDR invariant? It's, so let's call uh, mu har. This is har measure, measure on G mod gamma. And so the question, well, so let me, instead of telling you the answer so that there's a reason for you to come back tomorrow, I, will, I won't tell you the answer, but we can ask what is the Ziegel transform of this Haar measure on G mod gamma? So it is SLDR invariant, SLDR invariant measure on, on Rd. So an SLDR invariant measure on Rd is the delta mass at zero plus, so it's a linear combination of Lebesgue measure and delta mass at zero. 
So these numbers, A and B, are the numbers we want to understand. So we, we, I would like to compute uh, these numbers. So we have this higher measure on G mod gamma, which is the volume, and we would like to understand how that moves. So I'll talk about that uh, tomorrow. Thanks.